The title of my presentation is Liver Transplantation and Retransplantation in COVID-19 Positive Patient Due to Acetaminophen-Induced Acute Liver Failure. Um, I have no disclosures. And I would just like to bring your attention to the 150 million paracetamol generic um, drugs sold over the counter in the European Union yearly, which puts Poland in the fourth place of um, bought uh, drugs uh, by its citizens. Now, we're all aware of the factors uh, which induce the toxicity of paracetamol, which is age, alcohol abuse, dehydration, tasting, nutritional insufficiency, hypoproteinic diet, smoking, liver and kidney disorders, intake of drugs, activating cytochrome P450, non-steroid um, anti-inflammatory drugs, and is COVID-19 one of them? So looking at the immunology um, of SARS-CoV-2, we have to uh, remember the tropism uh, for ACE2 expressing epithelial cells uh, of the respiratory tract, which is uh, at the first thing which is visible um, in the clinical presentation of patients. Now, patients with severe COVID-19 have symptoms of systemic hyperinflammation, and uh, the systemic inflammation results in vasodilation, allowing inflammatory lymphocytes, lymphocytic and monocytic infiltration of the lung and heart. And here, uh, okay. Okay, and here on the right-hand side uh, are the eight uh, inflammatory med uh, mediators which cause the systemic hyperinflammation. Um, we all notice, we all notice uh, um, CT scan uh, from COVID-19 patients uh, hospitalized due to uh, advanced pneumonia and uh, respiratory failure. Uh, but we cannot forget about um, the circulatory, uh, circulation um, system, which uh, causes DIC, Leuco, uh, leuco erythroblastic reactions, endothel uh, endothelitis, hemophagocytosis, cardiac muscle cell necrosis, and uh, microvesicular steatosis in the liver. Now, our case is of an 18-year-old female patient admitted to the Department of General Transplant and Liver Surgery for further treatment of acute liver failure induced by paracetamol overdose. On the 2nd of January this year, the patient uh, ingested 12.5 grams of acetaminophen. Uh, the overdose was confirmed as the first attempt of self-inflicted uh, harm. Uh, prior to admission, she was treated with uh, the standard N-acetylcysteine NAC regimen for acetaminophen overdose in the, toxicology, in, a, in the toxicology department at a different center. She was then referred to us three days later and upon uh, admission, uh, we ran a quick uh, patient health assessment. We continued uh, in a typical standard uh, Prescott protocol, the NAC treatment. We looked uh, carefully at the paracetamol le levels, monitoring them. The patient was moved into the liver ICU unit that we have for further fluid resuscitation and monitoring vitals. Uh, we ran the full liver test panels, abdominal ultrasound, CT with vascular reconstruction, cardiac uh, ultrasound, and two um, real-time PCR SARS-CoV-2 tests. Then we got the consults of the anesthetists, psychiatrists, uh, hepatologists, and uh, the surgical committee then sat down, analyzed uh, the results, and, um, and made the decision for uh, liver transplant. Um, liver function was assessed um, by using the King's College criteria uh, for acute liver failure, uh, common for most centers, but we're also aware that um, some centers still use the uh, ALF prognostic score or the West Haven criteria, and most of all surgeons use their common sense. So on the 5th of January, um, when she was admitted to our department, uh, her BMI was 27.9 and MEL score was 33. She weighed 75 kilograms. Uh, like I said, was qualified for urgent transplant. And um, on the day when, uh, on the day of transplantation, when 
she was lucky enough to have received uh, an, uh, the urgent liver. Uh, the test uh, results came in that she was uh, SARS-CoV-2 positive in both swab tests. Um, so these are uh, her lab tests um, upon admission and uh, the consecutive day. Uh, we could see that the transaminase levels um, were decreasing while the bilirubin level was rising, typical for acute liver failure. And um, um, the first transplant was performed um, using the classic technique with the veno veno venous bypass with an end-to-end cavocable uh, anastomosis and biliary stenosis. Um, the arterial anastomosis was first uh, performed uh, using the graft splenic artery uh, to the recipient's uh, right and left hepatic uh, conf artery confluence. This, however, um, gave us an insufficient flow and we decided to do a redo uh, anastomosis. And the second uh, anastomosis was using the recipient's proper hepatic artery um, and the graft's common hepatic artery, which gave us sufficient flow. The reperfusion was after nine hours of cold ischemia. And uh, the graft uh, was um, uh, matched in the appropriate matched blood type, uh, but it was from a sextagenarian, um, weighed at 2,228 uh, grams. So this is our team. And um, in the room here, we have uh, Professor Dudek and Dr. Skalski um, present um, with myself on the right-hand side. and. Uh, we used personal protective equipment, uh, and anyone who's ever uh, operated for longer than an hour in this knows that uh, it's like being in a sauna, nothing, uh, nothing really pleasant, actually a, a very big burden. So the first transplant was just under seven hours, and uh, the second liver transplant was uh, under five hours. Um, after the first transplant, uh, on, on the first post-operative day, we um, basically straight away um, observed elevation of uh, the liver enzymes and impaired liver synthetic function. And uh, here you can uh, see that uh, we actually ran three tests on the first post-operative day and then uh, on the second two. And you can observe the elevation of the uh, transaminase levels. Um, whereas also um, the um, white blood cell count um, um, increased. So um, she was uh, analyzed and uh, the MALT score was uh, accounted for 50. Ha um, hepatic artery thrombosis was ruled out um, and the patient was once again approved for urgent retransplantation due to, at that time, primary non-function versus acute graft rejection. Um, on the next day, on the 8th of January, uh, she, uh, her um, COVID-19 symptoms started to kick in. Pneumonia uh, caused by SARS-CoV-2 um, was um, advanced, um, and uh, that was uh, observed in the bedside chest x-ray with atelectasis, intrapleural fluid collection, and um, on the 9th, she received the second transplantation, again with the use of the veno-venous bypass, end-to-end cable and arterial and biliary anastomosis, but without any um, events. So the reperfusion was after four hours of cold ischemia. And here, uh, the, the, the day uh, preceding the second liver transplant was a, tomorrow, was a CT scan of um, advancing uh, changes in the lungs and um, forming lesions of necrosis in the uh, liver. So this is our team once again. This is the explanted first, uh, the, the first graft. And uh, post-operative events. Uh, so uh, we observed ki ki acute kidney injury um, treated with hemodialysis uh, throughout 18 days, uh, which was um, ended on the 27th of January. Uh, on the 14th, she was intubated. She required bronchoscopy um, due to atelectasis uh, from COVID-19. Um, on the 18th, uh, we finally received um, a negative SARS-CoV-2 PCR, real-time PCR test. Uh, on the 10th post-operative day, we ran an ultrasound. We weren't too worried about that. Uh, minor 
uh, fluid collections in the, abdo in the ab abdomen, uh, a small uh, five by three hemorrhage uh, in the gallbladder bed. And um, she was discharged from the uh, liver ICU on the um, 22nd, which was uh, the 13th post-operative day. And um, on the 6th of, uh, of uh, February, she was discharged from hospital. Um, this is also a chest x-ray showing um, the advanced pneumonia of the right lung especially. And um, the lab tests after the second liver transplant were um, on the first part of the on the first part of the uh, graph, you can see that there's we, we focused here on the first seven days as the next two weeks were rather uneventful and uh, um, and the normalization of the parameters was typical. So. Uh, what wasn't typical was that uh, the white blood count uh, was elevated for a longer period of time, and uh, we could see an inflammatory peak again uh, directly after bronchoscopy. Um, so she was after discharge. We have her in follow-up in our outpatient clinic. Uh, she uh, she uh, had a CT performed uh, on the 18th, uh, two weeks after discharge. Uh, which uh, basically showed uh, the reduction, reduction of inflammatory changes and, um, and proper liver uh, function um, as well. Now, um, we followed her up on uh, the 2nd uh, of um, November this year. She's uh, doing all well. Current weight is 65, so that's 10 kilos less with a BM, BMI of 24. We have a little bit of uh, trouble uh, with her concerning um, her compliance. Uh, she refused psychiatric care afterwards, uh, but her um, liver, liver parameters are very satisfactory, and basically she doesn't have any uh, post-COVID uh, symptoms. So to uh, conclude, Liver transplantation is feasible in patients with an ongoing active SARS-CoV-2 infection. Immunosuppression uh, regimen does not require modification. It was a typical, uh, typical immunosuppression standard uh, treatment. And uh, there's very little research available on patients undergoing liver transplants with active uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection. A lot of uh, the papers published actually are uh, on the post-operative period. Um, and um, questions to the floor. Um, we were wondering, was this favorable outcome, as, as she is doing pretty well, associated with the patient's young age, no underlying diseases, or was it a favorable uh, type of SARS-CoV-2 virus, symptom sparing virus? And the second question, would the approach and decision making to qualify a transplant um, COVID-19 positive patient be any different in an elective patient with a chronic liver disease? Thank you. Thank you very much. The very nice, nice case. I think there are many questions for uh, in this case. Um, so about what is your policy for uh, cirrhotic patients which are listed? Uh, and who come in for transplantation, do you do uh, a COVID test and do you do a chest X-ray systematically? Yes. Uh, the protocol was modified since the beginning of the COVID era. We used to only do a chest X-ray. Now we do a, a HRCT for all the patients. They get a double swab PCR test. They go to get a, a, a two-hour fast uh, P, uh, test antigen test, and then they also get a PCR test, all of the patients. And if it's positive and they are asymptomatic, what do you do? If they're asymptomatic and they're positive, we do not, we do not, uh, uh, we do not transplant. We always have a, okay. um, a like a reserved uh, um, recipient mm -hmm. called I, in. I, I have one question. The first transplant, the, the, the graft, what sort of graft was it? So it was a graft from a 69-year-old male patient weighing at 2,228 2, grams, whereas her liver was uh, 1,400 um, grams or so. 
Um, so it, it was fairly bigger. Um, it, it had about 30% of steatosis, microsteatosis. You, you presented two cases with large for size uh, 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 livers, uh, which is, is really a problem. Uh, do you have a policy to uh, refuse large for size uh, uh, livers in, uh, uh, when you have those allocations? Um, yes, we seem to be transplanting uh, all the bigger recipients, and we have a lot of small uh, recipients left on the waiting list. Um, but we try to measure the, the chest uh, circumference and the waist circumference, and um, it seems to be working pretty well to be able to fit in the appropriate uh, grafts into the recipients. However, in cases which, um, which concern acute liver failure, I mean, we just take the grafts that are available in, on the urgency, according to urgency. Um, however, I think uh, one of the best um, results is to either split or to um, reduce. I have a, uh, I don't know what is the experience in the audience, but uh, during the COVID time, how did you manage to transplant? As you know, everywhere in the world, the program has shrank completely because of the COVID. So what was your policy? Uh, did you manage still to do, to get easily have a graft uh, disposable for you or, or not? Because that was a major problem for us. Yes, thank you. That's an excellent question. Actually, it's a global problem. And um, what we noticed is that as long as the major, uh, major centers in Poland uh, were able to, um, to produce donors or to qualify donors, um, all the um, smaller uh, rural hospitals didn't. They were transformed into COVID centers. And um, that was a general um, governmental decision. And that reduced uh, by 50% almost uh, the donor, um, the donors in, in our country. Um, however, at our hospital, um, a lot of these operations, a lot of um, elective operations in general surgery operations, um, not that were non-oncological, were basically brought to a halt. And uh, only oncology was uh, back on uh, track well, and uh, liver transplants and general tr uh, transplants. The donor was local? Uh, we had last year, I believe, um, 18 or 20 donor local uh, procurements. No more this year. I, I don't have the data. René, you have a question yes. or comment? Yes, congratulations for your case. Uh, I'm a little bit uh, troubled by your summary. Obviously, you were obliged to transplant this patient because of fulminant hepatitis. But by saying in the summary, liver transplantation is feasible yeah, exactly. in patients with active uh, COVID plus uh, positivity, uh, we, this may suggest that we may transplant all the patient even with COVID. So my question to you is, for elective condition, would you agree on the fact that COVID is a contraindication to elective transplantation or not? Thank you for the question, Professor Adams. Um, I think that um, this is an excellent um, topic to be further discussed uh, because it seems that we will be facing more and more COVID patients. Um, for elective, with, like we, we mentioned, for elective asymptomatic patients, I don't think we would go for liver transplantation. Uh, but we have to keep in mind that uh, there will be um, PCR positive patients without uh, COVID symptoms. They will come out positive and they will have minor symptoms or they won't have large uh, COVID symptoms. And this is a case I think that needs to be discussed among experts. Yes, because we know, and Christophe uh, Zienewicz know that very well, because it's, it's an Elita study that was done in uh, all the European centre, and the mortality of patients transplanted electively for uh, any indication 
electively with COVID positive, positivity is very high. It's around 15 to 20 percent. And even more according to age and so on. So we should be very careful. You, you were obliged. In your case, you were obliged to do it because it's a fulminant hepatitis. So uh, uh, clearly, but for elective condition, I would be very, very re reluctant to say it could be or because the mortality is high. Yes, I agree with you. Uh, any other question? And we have a, a question also from uh, Prashant Bangi. Is he online? He can ask his question here. Is Prashant online? He has a question for you uh, asking uh, about the, um, the fact that you use the vena vena venous bypass in the transplant and asking because of the increased potential for DIC and chances of vascular thrombosis would you prefer to do a piggyback instead um, so initially I think our policy is that if we have uh, acute liver failure in healthy individuals without cirrhosis and portal hypertension then we do go for um, classic transplantation. And um, I think that this was the main cause uh, why we chose uh, uh, to use the venovenous bypass and not uh, an end-to-end caval anastomosis, not piggyback. But, I mean, we have performed also quite a number of uh, piggyback for ALF in the last three, four years, so. That, that was specific for this case, actually. Yes. This is the question from Prashant. And you have a... Thank you. Um, my question is more in general and coming next what was told. Our major problem now are not the patients with active infection, but the chronic patients that in PCR come positive for uh, virus particles. We had recently a case of a patient that we called electively for the, the for transplant with a pest uh, of a COVID inf infection uh, six months ago, and when we performed the test, it was positive at the thirtieth nine amplification. So we called our uh, infection center, and they told us you have to wait 24 hours to repeat the test. Many times we don't have 24 hours to repeat the test because we have a donor that it's not stable, that we have issues with the, with the, with the procedure. And so we have canceled that patient and we called a second receptor. The problem is every time I'll, uh, I call this patient, he can be always positive. So we kept him um, admitted for 24 hours and repeated the test and it was inconclusive again. So what I think we are going to, to deal is uh, with the patients that already had COVID more than six months ago, that have a positive or an inconclusive test when you call the patient and then you have to uh, repeat the test 24 hours after because we know, as Professor René Adam said, the results in patients we can have the, the infection is very, very worse. And what we don't know if, is, is if they are chronic positives or if they have a new infection after six months after the first one. So I think we should um, think about this and we should schedule uh, 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 and implement a protocol so about what to do in these patients because we, we are going to have patients that are chronically positive in the PCR test for COVID. What, 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 are you, uh, what do you do for your patient? I mean, I agree with René. I mean, the results were catastrophic, actually, for the COVID. So it's a very difficult setting. And I'm sure we won't have all the answers, but I've seen that tomorrow we'll have a lecture uh, about the registry, about the transplanted for COVID. The, the second thing is that these patients, they die. Now you know that they don't respond very well to the vaccine. So this is the other option, you have to make really sure that they have three doses and we have still to follow that to make sure that they are immune. But the problem is going to come when they will need the transplantation. 
I don't, I don't know yet, but the first results, first published literature that I saw, especially from the Italian uh, team, is not very good. Yes. So I think that we are facing some bad results coming up in the near future. So I don't know what we have to do in matter of uh, covering this patient, in matter of stimulating their immunity, in matter of immunosuppressant, what antibiotics you have to give, I still don't know. But I know that it was a terrible year last year, and this year I, I think we expect some not really good results for the patient who are on the waiting list. But I agree with you, you with all this variant, com, you know, contamination, different variant, ev all the patients will be positive. And even the donor will be positive. So when, we, when you amplificate uh, the specimen 42 times, mm -hmm. the probability of, ha of having some virus uh, protein or something be positive is very high. And I think we will face this problem. And the, the, the indications mm -hmm. are to repeat the test within 24 hours. Before mm -hmm. 24 hours, the result will, will, will not be uh, sufficient. So when you have to decide for a donor, you don't have normally 24 hours. So uh, I think we are going to face some problems uh, in the post uh, COVID uh, pandemic with some cases like this. And we faced it uh, two years, uh, two weeks ago, two weeks ago yeah. and we canceled the patient and we called another receptor. The, the same in UK. What is your experience the in Belgium? We, we don't, we, we uh, cancel all those patients. We, uh, uh, so we um, we test them. We we do the third. Uh, now they are all tr um, vaccinated the third time, and we follow uh, anti uh, antibodies. Okay. So we, there is a last question from uh, Prashad Bangi uh, uh, about th this patient, this clinical case. Uh, so he um, uh, probably, even though there is no. Uh, current uh, hepatic arterial thrombosis, there's probably um, a small vessel thrombosis wh which led to the um, primary non-function as there is a necrosis of, uh, of the liver graft. Uh, is, did you change your uh, anticoagulation strategy for these patients uh, after, after the second transplantation? No, no, it remained the same. Uh, we also rely on our... Um highly qualified ultrasonographist. I mean, for a liver transplant a team, it is crucial to have an excellent ultrasonographist as well as great radiology and or endoscopy. And um, well, our ultrasound ultrasonologist is sometimes even more precise than CT. Um, what he ruled out thrombosis for venous and arterial. Cool, thank you very much. Other comments in the floor? Thank you.